Roll into the second of the morning tide, my dear listener, Saint Max and Zoya, Nina Jivunia ushering us. 37 minutes past 9 o'clock, my dear listeners, I told you earlier that this second hour, as you know, answers from a Catholic segment is on. And I told you that I'm going to be with the Lou today to uh, happily talk about Saint Joseph, our spiritual father. And she is here ready to talk to her. Are you ready, uh, ready to talk to you? Are you ready? Ready to talk to her? SMS line 0712 or on Facebook page Radio Mini 88.3 FM. Good morning, Lou. Good morning, Graham. Happy, happy to uh, see you again today. Good to see you too. Glad yes. to be here on this cold July morning. Exactly. Cold July morning. Thank God today is a little bit sh uh, sh uh, uh, sunny, Lou. Yeah. It has been extremely cold. <laughs> Why? But we are making it anyway. Yes. Otherwise, you're well? Salama sana. Have you been uh, since we met last time? Happy. Yes. Yes, good. Uh -huh. Rested. Uh -huh. Rejuvenated. And you look like you look <laughs> all those things, by the way. Hey, see it in the hour. See it in the Lou. <laughs> anyway, Lou, yes. uh, Karibu sana. Uh, today we're going to be having a very interesting conversation here about mm -hmm. St. Joseph, our spiritual father. But first things first, for that uh, listener who's listening in for the very first time, she's wondering, Bram, who you Lou Ninani? Kindly introduce yourself, then we continue with the discussion. Yes, yeah, so my name is Lou. I'm part of the Answers from a Catholic Kenya mm -hmm. um, initiative, which is a community of young professionals um, who try to bring out catechesis and doctrine and apologetics just to make people understand and live the faith mm -hmm. um, so that they can grow closer to our Lord. All right. Yeah. So that they can grow closer to our Lord. And that is why exactly today we are also talking about St. Joseph, our spiritual father. Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. And talking about uh, St. Joseph Lou, um, last uh, time uh, you were here, no, 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 that was Malimu Sheila last week, yeah. we talked about the title of Jesus, okay? Yeah, yeah. And then here, again, I don't know whether it is coincidental, I don't know whether you talked <laughs> behind the tent, uh -huh. so that today we talk about St. Joseph. Yeah. Anyway, St. Joseph, according to Pope Francis' own words, uh, says that he's an intercessor, a support, and a guide in terms of trouble. Let's begin there, Lou. Yeah, yeah. When do we, first of all, meet St. Joseph? Yeah, so we, we, we come into the knowledge of St. Joseph when he's introduced to us as being betrothed to Our Lady, mm. right? So this is a man who is about to get married. He's, in a sense, when the, when the Bible says betrothed, it's, you could say it's he's engaged. Mm. And he's first introduced to us in a moment of crisis because he discovered that the lady that he's engaged to is pregnant mm. and he has to make a decision about how to handle the situation because, of course, it's going to bring a lot of shame to the Blessed Virgin Mary mm -hmm. uh, but he knows deep down in his heart that Our Lady is a virtuous mm -hmm. young lady and that um, this 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 cannot be something that is easy for her to carry but it's also going to bring her a lot of disgrace in society mm -hmm. and so he, he withdraws and he in a sense he prays about it and he comes to a decision through a dream where an angel reveals to him that he actually should take Our Lady as his wife mm -hmm. and so when St. Joseph is introduced to us, he's introduced to us, one, as a man of prayer, mm -hmm. who discerns difficult decisions in moments of prayer, and also one who is obedient, mm -hmm. right? The angel reveals to him what God wants him to do, and he immediately does it, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's how we first meet St. Joseph, a man of very few words, a man who's not spoken of much in Scripture, a man who barely says anything in Scripture, mm -hmm. but whose life is... A model of virtue for us. All right. Yeah. And you've talked about a man of a uh, few words. Yeah. And is there any place in the uh, scripture where St. Joseph is recorded to have said a word? Not really. <laughs> Not really. We, we, we don't really have any words that we can quote that this was said by St. Joseph. Yeah. What scripture has done or what um, revelation has given us is the actions of St. Joseph, a man who literally just lived a hidden life, was a worker, was a carpenter, and then became this pivotal figure in the life of the Holy Family. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no... Per you could you could say maybe what he, he did say was he was the one who was given the, the name Jesus, right? It was the angel that declared to him, you shall name him Jesus because he'll be the savior of all peoples. Yeah. So that is, in a sense, 
without him being given that name Jesus mm-hmm. then that introduction would not have happened within scripture right. so he's the bearer of this name mm-hmm. and this was also because in Jewish tradition and in Jewish culture it was the man who named the child mm-hmm. which is why much later you see it is Zechariah who's given the name or who's given the mandate to name John the Baptist exactly. and not Elizabeth yeah. and so she does it on his behalf because mm-hmm. he cannot speak right. um so that was that was his pivotal entry as the role of father mm-hmm. and as the one who introduces to us this great name of our lord mm-hmm. I, 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 and you see i was uh, uh doing uh, some research and i came across an article that was written uh mm-hmm. by um, M- mother agnes mother superior of sister of life and she yeah. says that the reason as to why she thinks that joseph didn't uh, has not been quoted anywhere to have spoken a word it is because mm-hmm. He actually brought us the word itself. Exactly, exactly. That's what she said. Right. And you've actually brought it out very interestingly, Lou, mm-hmm. that the naming part. Uh, uh, now, is it is there a possibility where we can link the role, the naming role of uh, mm-hmm. Joseph mm-hmm. and the naming role of Adam in the book of Genesis? Yeah, so um, from from how our Lord ordained things, the act of naming is actually a, a very powerful role that a person has mm-hmm. and that's why when he when he first um brings out creation he gives that responsibility to adam in a sense who is the first man mm-hmm. to be able to name all the creation all the creatures and all the things that god has put together um and so with that responsibility and authority over creation then he gives joseph the role of being able to name the son of mm-hmm. god mm-hmm. so that in a sense and and so naming became that the person who had the power to name thus developed a relationship over the things that he named okay. adam naming all creatures then has gives humanity mankind mm-hmm. dominion over all creatures over everything that is on the earth mm-hmm. right that's why everything is at the service of man mm-hmm. because of adam's naming power and the 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 climax of the human person within all of creation mm-hmm. god only gives a human being that responsibility mm-hmm. and so when when joseph is introduced into what we would call now the story of salvation he's the one with the responsibility of naming jesus yeah. and so he establishes a relationship a dear relationship as truly the father of the son mm-hmm. even though you would not say that he is um by normal ordinances the father but he is the foster father of jesus, jesus and he yeah. takes up that responsibility responsibility mm-hmm. as a true father mm-hmm. in naming him and and talking about uh, as a true father we've just said that indeed um he's a silent saint in the scripture yeah. can yeah. you attribute his silence to already the weight he was carrying um the weight the weight of of giving us uh of giving the name Jesus Christ as instructed yes, by the angel. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you you could say like I think you know he was very aware mm-hmm. that our lady was a very special woman. Yeah. And even though you know at some point it's where sometimes we think that you know he was angry or mad at our lady mm-hmm. um for being pregnant, but the truth is you know when we are around very holy people Yeah. In a sense when something happens around them that we don't understand or we question mm-hmm. we don't necessarily we're not quick to say that it is a person who is bad we always we always tend to think something must have happened that created this very difficult situation yeah. and so Joseph first encounters that the woman that he's betrothed to is a very holy woman mm-hmm. so it cannot be that the mistake is on her end it must be something that is a mystery something that is not of the human hand and so he becomes in a sense the centerpiece to a very to take care and have authority over a very holy woman woman mm-hmm. and a very holy child mm-hmm. right and so saint joseph decides in a sense to take a back seat in order to bring out the prominence of his own son mm-hmm. and the prominence of our lady but also because of the fact that our lord was only going to manifest himself years later when he's 30 at the wedding feast in Cana mm-hmm. then it becomes very natural that nobody would assume that there was any sp- anything special about Jesus because he was the father of a carpenter right. a mere carpenter and the husband of Mary who was someone who was not prominent who did not stand out in society and so he family in this little town of Nazareth right mm-hmm. it's like you would almost say if you just met some some guy in Juguna you know who's married to some lady mm-hmm. 
Atieno. You would never think that there's any special anything special about them because they're just ordinary people in the village yes. who just come together and they're living their normal life. And so that's what Saint Joseph in a sense did. You see, of the two he was he was not one who was like immaculately conceived. He was not um true God and true man like our Lord. He was actually just like us, mm-hmm. a mere human being who was surrounded, you know, married to the most holiest of women mm-hmm. women and the father to the most holiest of children mm-hmm. and so he becomes this emblem of a man who hides behind the life of two very great saints mm-hmm. with whom he spends the rest of his life with okay yeah well, well explained they're talking about getting married to the the, the holiest be the ho- holy being and yeah. being a father to the yeah. holiest being yeah and acting as a veil yeah and yet he evokes the virtue of humility. Yeah, very much. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so St. Joseph, um, I think this is one of his greatest virtues because um, he actually has to be the father of God, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And so he has to um, have some form of authority and guidance to a boy who he knows is going to be the savior of the world mm-hmm. because, of course, he had already been revealed this in a dream when he was very young in his betrothal to Our Lady. Um, and then also... Um, when he's confused about things, he he resolves to prayer. It's it's true we can say that it is the angel who comes to him in a dream, but you see, in order to be able to be receptive to the angel's message, he must have been a very contemplative man. Exactly. So he he was very quick to put aside his own will and his own desires mm-hmm. in order to do what God wants, and that takes a lot of humility yeah. because it's in pride that we stick to what we want to do, how we want to do it, because we think we know better. Mm-hmm. So he could have said, "This woman is going to disgrace me in society, so let me leave her." and put her aside and go on with the rest of my life mm-hmm. but he decides to obey and he takes our lady into his life and then much later he gets another dream that now herod who is very um um, suspicious about this redeemer king that he hears about and he decides to go on a rampage killing children and again saint joseph gets a dream and in it the angel reveals to him that he must leave um Nazareth in order to um, to flee to Egypt to protect the Holy Family, which is Our Lady and and the baby Jesus. And without thinking twice, he obeys, mm-hmm. right? And that requires a lot of humility because he could have done something different. Yeah. And then even then, um, he gets the message that now Herod is dead and he must return. Mm-hmm. He must return to Nazareth. Um, and he does so even with doubts that now the the son of Herod, who is a more vicious king, mm-hmm. is going to destroy, is going to come and destroy his family. Um, but the angel reassures him that even with his doubts, he's doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. And so um, Saint Joseph has this. He he has a double virtue of obedience and humility. He and he he. He always depends on prayer mm-hmm. and discernment of what he needs to do in the presence of God. And so he's given the gift of having the angel come to him in dreams. Mm-hmm. Um, and even then, he's able to be able to determine that this is the voice of God. And so he doesn't doubt and he acts immediately. And when he does doubt, mm-hmm. he goes back to prayer to discern, is this the right decision? And when he does get the clarity, even with as little information as he has, he always acts. And so he evokes constantly that um, in order to, to be humble, we must be obedient, but more so to be obedient to the will of God uh, yeah. and, and to put aside our own desires mm-hmm. for the greater glory of God. And that is where, in a sense, I think that's even the beauty of why St. Joseph doesn't necessarily need words mm-hmm. in order for us to, to be able to model him. Yeah. Because he just, he does, right? Because there are saints who say... Um, it is not your sweet words that I love. It is your actions. Mm-hmm. Your actions are what tell me how much you love. Yeah. Um, and so St. Joseph is able to evoke this because of his, his spirit of obedience and his spirit of humility. All right. And talk about humility, Lou. Yeah. Even though you actually uh, speak effortlessly about St. Joseph and how his humility actually come at play and how we can emulate him, mm-hmm. we ought to agree that his mission wasn't easy. You're right. It, it wasn't. W- it wasn't easy, right? Yeah. Look at this. He faced numerous uh, unexpected challenges. Mary's pregnancy, first mm-hmm. of all, came mm-hmm. along with its own fair share of challenges. Yeah. Herod slaughtering the innocent uh, children, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And then the journey to Egypt yeah. and returning. And then yeah. you look at it. Each time Joseph was actually coming in contact with these particular challenges, he summoned the courage to face the unknown. Yeah. And he decided to do the hard work to which God has called him. Something that is very, very difficult for us as human beings to actually try to emulate. 
okay? The moment we face such kind of challenges or a little bit of a, a challenge amidst the calling that we have, we tend to actually now uh, leave our fleshly desires to take charge. Yeah. Something that actually Joseph restrained himself from doing. Yeah. Tell us something about that. Yeah, so he's he's actually known as a protector of virgins, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Because of the fact that he was able to, you know, he wanted to get married and now he's, he's betrothed to this lady who um, has conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so he decides to protect the virginity of Our Lady because tradition does tell us that Our Lady remained perpetually a virgin. Mm -hmm. um, and so he, he he's able to take on this task to be the husband of Our Lady um, and he puts aside his passions and his desires and he also lives a chaste life and mm -hmm. tradition does tell us that St. Joseph did not have any other children um, and neither did Our Lady. Mm -hmm. And so he becomes known as the guardian of virgins because one, as an example to all men, he is a person who has learned to master his passions um, and to be the guardian of other virgins being Our Lady and um, and Our Lord as well. And so this, this self-mastery, this ability to learn to sacrifice for others, right? Because we cannot be able to love if we do not um, have a spirit and a willing, a joyful, willing spirit of sacrifice. Yeah. So St. Joseph becomes um, that emblem when it comes to, to charity, when it comes to fatherhood, when it comes to leading, when it comes to choosing one's family, which is also why he's usually called mm -hmm. the pillar of families. Because, you know, when, whenever we think about the Holy Family, even in most paintings and images, you know, St. Joseph is always shown taller than Our Lady. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll never know whether he was taller or not. Or maybe we will um, if we look at pictures of or depictions. Mm -hmm. But the, I think even the reason why he's always shown much taller and hovering over Our Lady with a lot of um, devotion and mm -hmm. love is because there was this essence of the protection, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He knew that he, like, he's very silent, simple role among these two virgins mm -hmm. was because that was his role to play in the salvation story and even Pope Francis has this really strong idea that because of the silent life of St. Joseph and because of his perpetual chastity and his ability to love and give himself over and over again mm -hmm. um, thinking more about the needs of his family than his own then he he says that it's it's so beautiful to see that because St. Joseph does this hidden role then we can be able to see that even our own simple hidden lives that are probably not going to be very great and magnanimous and be, be shown on, on TV or um, be publicized can be a pathway to God's work, God's great work being done, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because without the presence of St. Joseph and his hidden nature, mm -hmm. then our lady, like the salvation story would not have happened the way it did, All right? right? Mm -hmm. um, and so he gives, and also remember then, he becomes the one who models who our Lord will become. Mm -hmm. So the virtues, because he is the father, so the virtues of the son, you would say are the virtues of the father. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well put. And talking about virtues here, we can see that St. Uh, Joseph wields so many titles. On uh, December 8th, 1870, mm -hmm. Paul, uh, blessed Pope Pius the Sixteenth mm. named Saint Joseph the patron of the yeah. universe, Universal Church. Yes, tell us something about that. Yeah, so um, Pope Pius the the Ninth named Saint Joseph the patron of the Universal Church of yeah, the, of the yeah. whole Church, mm -hmm. um, and he he wanted to. This was because nothing like this had ever been done before, right? The church had focused a lot on Our Lady and her being the spiritual mother. But there was this, I guess, St. Joseph has always been the hidden character in the Holy Family. Mm -hmm. And so St. Um, Pope Pius IX, uh, blessed Pope Pius IX, oh. then brings in this um, this title of St. Joseph as a universal patron of the church. Because, of course, the church is always facing crisis. Mm -hmm. The church is always um, being attacked. And so he becomes the one who is, if he could lead the Our Lady and... Um, and our Lord, and that, in a sense, you could say was the first holy aspect of the church. And also remember the first church is the home, right? Mm -hmm. So if he led these two saints, then he could lead the entire church. Mm -hmm. Because from St. You remember when um, at the cross, when our Lord gives um, 
saint john to our lady and, and and the reverse in a sense he gives the whole church when he gives saint john to our lady he gives the whole church to our lady mm -hmm. and so the whole church in a sense has always been under the mantle of our lady um even with the blood of christ being the one that saves the church and so saint joseph then gets he gets back this title but in a much greater way because now we can look to him as the intercessor for the needs of the church when the when the church is in crisis. And Pope Francis always talks a lot also about this idea that when when we have crisis within the church, to have intercession to Saint Joseph, because his role is to protect the church as he protected the Holy Family. All right. And so um, that's how Pope Pius IX comes up with this um, mm -hmm. with this feast. Okay. With this title. And and then talking about that feast again, I want us to mm. take, I don't know whether you have a minute from 10. Yes, do? yes. Good. Thank you for being gracious mm -hmm. enough. We're going to be coming back and continue with the titles that uh, St. Joseph wields. Apart from that, we can see that uh, he actually, the, the feast of St. Joseph the Worker that yeah. was actually uh, instituted in 1955. Yeah. We're going to be talking more about that. My dear listener, you have a question. Lou is here to respond to all of your, your questions. And by the way, we are talking about Saint Joseph, our spiritual father. We are taking a very, very short break for news headlines because uh, just uh, two minutes to 10, at exactly 10, we're going to be having uh, news in brief and then we'll be back with Lou to continue the discussion and also having a look at some of your messages. Feel free, 0712-223385 is the SMS line or on Facebook page, Radio Mini 88.3 FM. <laughs> Oh, 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 
you are. Thank you so much for staying tuned to Radio Mini 88.3 FM and thank you for choosing the Morning Tide six minutes into the third hour. Alright, my name is Bram Odopio and wherever you are, Karibu Sana remember if you are joining us right now, you're wondering Bram, what are you talking about today? Remember, it is the answers from a Catholic segment and we are still here with my friend Lou talking about Saint Joseph, our spiritual father. Do you have a question? 0712 22 or on Facebook page Radio Mini 88.3 FM. Yes, Lou, before we went for that break for headlines, you had mm-hmm. actually taken us uh, uh, back to uh, what uh, Blessed uh, Pius the Ninth did by declaring patron, uh, Saint Joseph, a patron uh, of the uh, Catholic Church, right? Yeah. And then I promise that when we come back, we're going to be talking about what happened in 1955. Okay. Yes, yes. Yes. Tell us something about the institution of the feast of Saint Joseph the Worker. Yeah. So um, in in 1955, communism was was very rampant in yeah. most of Europe, and so um, the ideas of communism, by the way, are, are very divergent to the teachings of the Catholic Church, mm-hmm. and one of them being that um, communism communism proposed that the end of man's um, 
the end of of man's life per se was to work right mm -hmm. because communism proposes ideas that we have to milk the human person from what they have right. and so work became in a sense a god of some kind mm -hmm. that if one was not working on or was not providing or producing anything in society mm -hmm. then in a sense they were useless mm -hmm. and so um venerable pious the 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 twelfth <laughs> at, at this point in time is a pope and he realizes that the the ideas of communism are becoming very very rampant right and these are the kinds of ideas that could lead to a lot of workaholism could lead to the degradation of the dignity of the human person and so um at that point in time what had been tradition globally was that may 1st was actually known as workers day mm -hmm. and was the day where even communists would come up to celebrate um this idea of work but an idea of work that was the end of man's existence and so the pope says like we have to transform this idea and actually put god at the center of man's existence right okay, yeah. that the end of man's life is union with god mm -hmm. and, and that's why in a sense we can say the life of of a christian is at the end to be able to see god mm -hmm. and so he he then says that you know what we're going to institute the feast of saint joseph the worker because saint joseph being a carpenter being an ordinary person being somebody that you know, every Tom, Dick, and Harry can emulate mm -hmm. uh, because he did his work and he did it diligently and he did it within a family environment in order to provide for Our Lady and Our Lord. And so he became this emblem of doing work well, doing honest work of whatever kind it may be, mm -hmm. whether it's a small job or a very big job. And also remembering to offer up that work to God because in a sense, our work is a means that we can use to grow closer to, to our Lord. And so then May 1st becomes transformed into the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker. Yes. So even in many countries you have Labor Day, whereas in the Catholic Church we actually would be celebrating on May 1st mm -hmm. um, St. Joseph the Worker. And also you can see like um, within the history of the church how the, the popes have been very... Um, Pivotal in bringing and guiding the church to grow closer and closer to our um, to Saint Joseph, mm -hmm. as well as to the rest of the Holy Family. All right. Yeah. Well put. And what about uh, Saint John Paul the Second? Yeah. So Saint John Paul the Second actually, um, you know, he always said that one cannot have devotion to Our Lady without having devotion to Saint Joseph. Okay. And Saint John Paul II was very, very Marian. Mm -hmm. So during his papacy in 1989, I think he wrote um, he wrote an encyclical titled um, Guardian of the Redeemer. Mm -hmm. And that's actually how the title of Guardian of the Redeemer, as one of the titles of St. Joseph, that's in the litany of St. Joseph, came about. And there he unpacks this idea um, of um, St. Joseph being the protector of um, the Blessed Virgin Mary, but also the protector of the child Jesus, because sometimes we can forget that um, our Lord was both God and man. So the human side of um of jesus need needed to be formed and molded by somebody and so that formation was given by saint joseph and so he brings out in this encyclical the um, the pivotal place of a father in a son's life mm -hmm. of a father um as a as um an authority figure in his family but also as a husband right mm -hmm. and and you know saint joseph um or rather pope um, St. John Paul II, having lost his family very, very young um, mm -hmm. in his life, you know, he first lost his mother and then his father died right after that. Um, so he knew the lack of a father figure and he knew the lack of a mother figure and which is why um, St. John Paul II dedicated himself to Our Lady um, and is famous for, for giving or consecrating himself to Our Lady. But also it, it goes without saying that he would have had a lot of devotion to St. Joseph. And even in Poland, there was already a growing devotion to St. Joseph. Mm -hmm. um, and so being a, a, a Polish man, he brings this, these devotions that he has as a, as a Polish person when he becomes now a Pope and, and the Bishop of Rome. All right. Yeah. Well put, Lou. And then St. Louis um, Ginella mm -hmm. called attention of St. Joseph as the patron of a happy death. Yes. Why? Yes. Yeah, because you know they say that um nowhere is it mentioned that Saint Joseph died, you know, as as scripture is, it doesn't really mention much. Mm -hmm. But then it, it has been said by tradition and theologians that Saint Joseph must actually have died a happy death because he was surrounded by the holiest of people yeah. on earth, which mm -hmm. is Our Lady and Saint Joseph. Mm -hmm. And so um it's been said that Saint Joseph having given his life to the service of the salvation story mm -hmm. with these two characters being very crucial to the salvation story that he must have died such a happy and peaceful death surrounded by our lady and our lord um, and so being the patron of a, of a happy death 
even the church tells us that if we want to die happy, mm -hmm. the thing we need to do most is be very close to our Lord, which is what St. Joseph was, mm -hmm. right? He spent his entire days for the service and, you know, loving and caring for these two holy saints. Mm -hmm. And so there is no way he could have, he could have died a sad, tragic death. Okay. So he must have died in peace um, and in one with, you know, in union with our Lord, in a sense. Yeah. Okay, so. all right. And then on 8th December 2020, something yeah. beautiful again happened. Yeah, so for the first time in the church history and also in the history of the world, yeah. um, on 8th of December 2020, um, in the height of the pandemic, um, Pope Francis declared the year of St. Joseph. Mm -hmm. And this was approximately 150 years after Blessed Pius IX had declared St. Joseph a patron of the Universal Church. Mm -hmm. I mean, so for the first time, the church was able to get to know who St. Joseph was, right? Because, um, and Pope Francis put him forth as a strong intercessor, but also as a model, a model for men, a model for women, a model for all of the church, being a worker, being a father, um, being somebody who was also a leader within the church and, and being a saint. Then in so and then also he wrote um he wrote a letter known as Patris Corde in Latin, which means with a father's heart, because his first his first in a sense um sentiments of Saint Joseph that was that of all the people within the family, Saint Joseph must have loved our Lord with a father's heart, right? Okay. Because he was given that grave responsibility of being the father of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so he must have given his everything to be a father to this boy. Mm -hmm. um, and so he writes this letter where he talks about the different virtues. I And I think it's it's a beautiful short letter that I think everybody should read. Um, and also something that people can read um, very slowly just to understand the personhood of St. Joseph mm -hmm. and why we need to emulate him more. Um, so St. Joseph, um, um, Pope Francis pours a lot the virtues that we can be able to see in the life of St. Joseph and why St. Joseph is critical. And I think that was like a very beautiful thing for him to do because since mm -hmm. then, a lot more devotion has been given to St. Joseph as an intercessor and a model within the entire church. All right. Yeah. Well put. And talking about uh, that law, again, yeah. we see um, the, the, when the angel appeared to St. Joseph, mm -hmm. there is a way he greeted him. Right. Son of David. Yes. Okay. Yes, yeah. Let us now dive deeper into these prominent titles yeah. of St. Joseph. Yeah. So his, his most important title has been said um, to be that of Son of David. Mm -hmm. And the reason for this is because um, back in the book of Samuel, the prophet Nathan had prophesied to David, King David at that time, that from his lineage would come a man who would rule all of Israel and the entire world mm -hmm. and would be the savior of, of, of the entire um, nation, the chosen people. And so it so happens, you fast forward a couple of generations later, that Joseph himself, this Joseph who was from the little city of Nazareth, mm -hmm. is actually from the lineage of David. And we're able to know this because um, in St. Luke, we're first introduced to Joseph going to going to nazareth for the census that has been called and and the practice back then was that one would go to one's hometown mm -hmm. a bit like now how you would go to shags to get registered because that's where your family those are the roots of your family so um saint joseph left nazareth and went to bethlehem mm -hmm. because that was in a sense the 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 place where saint um king david's lineage was from and so we're able to see this identification with um, with the son of with the son of David, and remember when he goes to um, register himself for the census, he not only registers himself, but he registers Our Lady and Our Lord, mm -hmm. and so these people become under the lineage because this is something that you would say is something that then stamps the idea that now that he is married to Our Lady and that Saint and Our Lord is his son, um, Jesus is his son, mm -hmm. then all of these people become come under the lineage are known historically and from then on mm -hmm. to be under the lineage of the king david, david and yeah. so the prophecy that nathan had prophesied is fulfilled mm -hmm. that this joseph being the son of david and his son being jesus mm -hmm. then um the prophecy is then complete mm -hmm. jesus becomes the one who fulfills the promise that had been made to um within the lineage of King David. King David, well put. Yeah. Uh, yes. And also, he's referred to as uh, the pillar of families. Yeah. Uh -huh. Pillar of families, especially because of his pivotal role as a father 
um and and the church presents us to him with this title as pillar of families mm-hmm. and all of these titles by the way come from the litany of saint joseph um so he becomes a pillar of families because of his critical role as a father figure and so he becomes the person to whom fathers can model in terms of generosity in terms of love in terms of presence in terms of self sacrifice in terms of self gift mm-hmm. um which i think is beautiful because also you know um I, i always think that you know god could have chosen another kind of person to be the father of baby jesus and yeah. the blessed virgin mary um it could have been a king it could have been a prominent figure in israel but he chose a simple guy mm-hmm. who cuts wood and makes tables and chairs mm-hmm. and such kinds of things right mm-hmm. which is great because like if we think about our own fathers or at least mine you know he's not a prominent guy he's just a guy who's doing his daily job to get things done and provide for the family yeah. and so it becomes easy for a man to identify with the person of saint joseph it becomes even easy for people who are just normal workers you know trying to get through the grind of the day and make an income to identify with him because he did simple tasks with his hands you know he wasn't some intellectual or some theologian he was just a simple guy taking care of a lady and a kid mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and so what what an amazing person to emulate in terms of seeing the virtues of a father seeing the virtues of a worker seeing the virtues that are necessary within the family in order for families to thrive and to grow and to be fruitful and so he becomes then the pillar of families right. somebody whom even people who come from broken families can emulate you know mm-hmm. like the way um John Paul II would say I give myself to a lady and to Saint Joseph because I have no parents mm-hmm. and so in crisis whether it's in crises of marriage for women they can have devotion to Saint Joseph in crises of fatherhood for men they can have devotion to Saint Joseph in crises of where children have no father figure or are struggling with a father figure they can have devotion to Saint Joseph in many areas where people are struggling within the family they can call on the patronage and the help of saint joseph oh wow look at that so he has a lot of um uh, power and a lot of responsibilities there now having said that lu look at the way he mm-hmm. also protected his own chastity yeah look at the way he protected our lady and our lord yeah does it also give him another title yeah it gives him it gives him the title of um actually it gives him two titles that mm-hmm. the description it gives him the title of the guardian of the virgins mm-hmm. but it also gives him the title of terror of demons okay. and the reason he's given that title is because um the devil hates anybody who has a lot of reverence for god okay. right mm-hmm. and so if if saint joseph was an authority figure over jesus who was god mm-hmm. then that was somebody who was a threat to the devil and so he's invoked as a person who one he protects chastity mm-hmm. which is something the devil hates which is why he terrorizes us with with passions and sensuality and all of those things yeah. um and so to live a life of chastity is is a difficult thing and when we fall in it the devil is quite happy mm-hmm. and so he gets the title of guardian of virgins and terror of demons and also because he protected the holy family in moments of crisis mm-hmm. in the threat of death in the threat of um lacking many things and the threat way of course the devil did not want the salvation story to happen so it must have been actually mm-hmm. that saint joseph was terrorized remember he was just a human being so he must have been terrorized a lot by the devil to forgo his vocation to forgo his role um in the family to forgo his which is what the devil does in terms of the crisis of the family yeah. that we see in society and so saint joseph has been loved and called upon even in moments of crisis mm-hmm. because of this title of terror of demons right. because it, the demons shudder at the authority of saint joseph well put there is a question here from uh, mm-hmm. uh from eva uh, mm-hmm. all the way from langata says towards yeah. the end of genesis joseph dies which joseph becomes the father the foster father of jesus christ towards the end of genesis Mm-hmm. Joseph dies which mm-hmm. Joseph becomes the foster father of Jesus Christ. Mm. Yes. I, th- I think she's referring to Joseph the son of Jacob, Jacob. who dies mm-hmm. um who became um like a leader under the king yes. to whom the Israelites go. Mm-hmm. Um but we we talk about Saint Joseph as if the the Saint Joseph we're talking about as a foster father mm-hmm. is the one who is in the new testament, testament the one who's married exactly. to our lady yes, because in a sense he was not the um like you see there was no seed of Saint Joseph that was used to to bring our lord into birth because our lady was conceived by the power of the holy yes. spirit mm-hmm. so the truest title is that he is a foster father mm-hmm. um and hence we call him in a sense the, the patron of families or the patron and guardian of the redeemer 
because he was not the true father in the sense of um genetically yeah. but in terms of love you could say he was um he was a father by the desire to love mm -hmm. um our lord as his own child all right and that is mm -hmm. why he was so open to god's word that even came uh to him as he slept and yeah. talking about sleeping lou now mm -hmm. take us through the four dreams of saint joseph and the lessons on obedience as well yeah so the um, the the first dream was around um we had mentioned it at the beginning where um, St. Joseph is told to take Our Lady um, to be his wife and he's also given the name of, of Jesus so that's a fast dream which he obeys and he does and the second dream is when he's given the mandate to leave um, to leave Israel and move to Egypt in order to avoid the killing of the Holy Innocents which happened um, because now Herod his kingship yeah. and then the third one is when now herod is dead and an angel asks him to go back to nazareth because that is in a sense where he's supposed to be um and now all threats are are gone and so he decides to to return and then somewhere in the middle of returning back to to nazareth he has doubts because he knows that the herod son is even more vicious than herod mm -hmm. and that he's under threat of being killed but the angel reveals to him in this fourth dream that um no threat will come to the holy family and so he obeys um for the fourth time and goes goes back to nazareth and hence that's why we we come to know of jesus as jesus of nazareth mm -hmm. right because wow. also that fulfills scripture that he was actually from nazareth All and right. he lives his life there wow yeah well explained you know i didn't know that by the way yeah, <laughs> yeah. i really 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 did. now understand uh, that lou thank you so much for coming my dear yeah. listener 0712223385 is uh, the sms line or on facebook page radio mini 88.3 fm now uh, lou mm -hmm. in every situation mm -hmm. joseph declared his own fiat yeah okay yeah tell us something about that yeah, so, um, you know, we, we usually think that, um, or rather, we, we always talk about the fiat or doing the will of God as something attributable to our lead. But I think now, having come to learn a lot more about St. Joseph, yeah. um, we can say that, yeah, St. Joseph himself did say yes, that our Lord's will be done in very different moments. In a sense, he didn't use the words Our Lady used, mm -hmm. but by his actions, by the way he took care of the Holy Family, by the way he prayed and did the will of God, then he also gave his fiat. Mm -hmm. um, and so he becomes then this um, saint that we can also have devotion to when we have to make difficult decisions, especially when these decisions are about our interior life. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. and then there is something that we commemorate on the 28th of December yeah right. yeah tell us what is it yeah so um and you could say also this feast is mm -hmm. surrounded by the story of saint joseph so 28th december is a feast of the holy innocence mm -hmm. um which we celebrate just a few days after christmas yeah. and it's a feast where we we celebrate um actually the dignity of life the church will celebrate dignity mm -hmm. of life because it was at this time that herod killed a lot of the children mm -hmm. um in in bethlehem because he had already gotten the prophecy from the wise men that they were coming to pay homage to this new king that had been born because of the star in the east um and so herod being you know a man who was full of himself and did not want any threats to his kingship mm -hmm. decides to kill all children under the age of two and so there becomes this massacre of innocent children yeah. whereas at this point in time joseph being the protector of his family has taken our lady and 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 jesus and the and the fled the fled to egypt mm -hmm. um after the baby has been born to prevent him from being killed mm -hmm. yeah okay so that's how the feast comes up powerful yeah and talking about the feasts uh lou you are very good uh with the stories mm -hmm. t t tell us the story about saint joseph and the priests Yes, it's one of my it's one of my favorite stories, especially because it happens in Poland, which is the home of John Paul II, okay. whom I love so much. So it it happened that um, this is so the context of this story is the Second World War. So there's a camp in in Germany, very close to Munich, which is the more prominent um, city in Germany that this story is associated with, and it's called the Dachau Camp. Okay. So at this point in time, the head of this camp is is a Nazi leader called Heinrich Himmler, mm -hmm. and Heinrich Himmler has this is now towards the um towards the the end of the war 
um, Henrich Himmler has has put together this camp and he's put a lot of Polish people. And one of the great mandates that Henrich Himmler had was to get rid of Polish leaders of authority. And what that then was manifested as is that a lot of priests were actually captured and put in this Dachau camp, a lot of the Polish priests. Um, and it was said that at the beginning of, the, of World War II, Poland had around 10,000 priests. And by the time this camp had been set up, 20% of those priests had been encamped within the Dachau camp. Um, and so it so happens that um, the, the war is about to end and people are, are seeming to, to feel the victory of the Allied forces against the Nazis, mm -hmm. that it's going to happen soon. But the people who are in this camp know that there is no way the Nazis are going to let them go, even though the war is about to end. And so a group of um, Catholic priests that were in this Dachau camp come together on 14th of April, 1945, and they say, you know, we have to we have to pray because we know that the war is almost over, but the Nazis will never let us walk out of here alive. Mm -hmm. And so they think, who can we who can we pray to for protection? And being good Catholics, they pray to St. Joseph. Remember, St. Joseph had been declared um, in 1870 as a patron of the Catholic Church. Thank God for that. And so a lot of the church has devotion to St. Joseph as a protector. And so the priests begin to do a novena to St. Joseph. And already in Poland, which um, is a very, very Catholic country, had had devotion to what they called St. Joseph of Kalish. Okay. It's a town in Poland. And um, they had had a lot of devotion to St. Joseph in this particular city because they had prayed to him for various miracles and they had actually obtained them. So there was a growing devotion to St. Joseph in this small town of Kalish. Um, and so they prayed to this St. Joseph of Kalish um, who who was at, at that point in time was very well known as a protector of families and uh, because that's how his his devotion grew so they they start the novena on 14th of april 1945 to saint joseph for protection of their lives um and be known to them hemrich hitler Himmler, not Hitler, Himmler, mm -hmm. had actually uh, put down a declaration declaration on that specific day mm -hmm. stating that everybody within the cow camp had to be executed. Wow. So that was actually the... They, did not, they were not aware of this declaration. And so they start the novena on 14th of April mm -hmm. and they finish the novena on 22nd of April and they consecrate themselves to St. Joseph on the last day of the novena. Mm -hmm. Seven days later, on 29th of um, April 1945, the camp is miraculously um, rescued by the U.S. Allied troops. So they actually bombard the, the camp and they rescue all its inhabitants. Mm -hmm. And what they realized when they were now rescuing the, the Poles from, from this Dachau camp and executing the Germans who had kept them hostage was that they had found a letter in the offices of the Nazi leaders that Heinrich Hitler had actually said, given a mandate, that at 9 p.m. on that 29th of April, the entire camp was to be burned to the ground and all its people were to be killed. Wow. And so it was on that specific day that the U.S. troops invaded the camp and rescued them. And so, of course, all the 800 people and the priests who had consecrated themselves to St. Joseph on, um, on that 22nd when the novena ended attributed their protection to St. Joseph because that was a specific saint that they had all prayed to and that the priest had consecrated all 800 people who'd come for the, for the consecration to the protection and the patronage of St. Joseph. Mm -hmm. And so upon their release, um, they, they did a pilgrimage to St. Joseph of Kalish in their hometown. And now the devotion to St. Joseph spread even more widely within Poland and within Europe because of these priests. Wow. And so that's a beautiful story of the protection of, of St. Joseph, terror of demons. Oh, wow, how I wish we had more time so that we could continue <laughs> telling us these beautiful stories. Yeah. And now that you've yeah. actually brought us closer through this beautiful story of yeah. uh, the priest and St. Joseph, um, uh, Lou, what are some of the practical ways that we can use to actually grow um, the, the in devotion to yeah. uh, St. Joseph? Yeah, one, one very practical human way, which Pope Francis talks a lot about, um, is having like an image or a statue of St. Joseph. Right. I know it might seem a bit like crazy to some people, but you know, I think because, you know, we, we are human beings and we use our senses, our sight, our, our smell, our, our hands, a touch and all of that. So I think the same way we can have um, 
an image to remember our family members and to remember our faithful departed. I think this is also a way to have a beautiful image or a beautiful statue of St. Joseph. Mm -hmm. Pope Francis keeps one of a sleeping St. Joseph under which he usually puts his intentions. So he usually says that um, he has a, a sleeping St. Joseph in his room mm -hmm. and for any intentions he has, he writes them and he puts them under the, the statue of St. Joseph and he, and he devotes, he entrusts those intentions to St. Joseph. So that's one, one simple, easy way mm -hmm. um, to have a, a, a material reminder with, within our environment, whether in our rooms, our desks, even in our offices. Um, and then a second way is, you know, the church has actually dedicated Wednesdays to be the days of St. Joseph. Okay. So the way the church dedicates Saturday to Our Lady, mm -hmm. Sunday to Our Lord, and, you know, different days to different things, um, like Mondays for the Holy Souls in Pactory. Wednesday is actually the day that the church has dedicated to have more devotion to St. Joseph. Mm -hmm. So Wednesdays, which is tomorrow, can be a day going forward where people can um, just ask St. Joseph for more things, um, have, you know, say prayers to say, read a bit more on the life of St. Joseph. Mm -hmm. You know, those are practical ways. Um, you know, we can, it can be a day where we decide to read all the different documents that have been written out there. There's even a beautiful book that was written in the year of St. Joseph um, by a priest called Father Donald Calloway mm -hmm. um, called The Consecration to St. Joseph. A very, very, I think to date it's the only book that I've ever found the world right. have said about St. Joseph. Um, and then also, um, the the devotion to saint joseph is is also the month dedicated to saint joseph is march mm -hmm. because march 19th is the feast of saint joseph our father and lord yeah um so those are also good reminders um and i think maybe the um, another way mm -hmm. is to just have saint uh, um, devotion to saint joseph especially around people who are dying or who are sick that they can die a happy death right that okay. if we know that there are people who are whether they're in hospital whether they're they have a terminal illness um, or whether they're aged and nearing the time of death, that to ask them or to just propose to them to have this devotion to St. Joseph All right. for a happy death. Listen to this message. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lou. I have learned a lot that I didn't know about St. Joseph. Welcome. And that is Happy the, to have helped. Yes. That is the yes. best part to wind yes. uh, up this conversation, Lou. Uh, yeah. I, I'll give you a minute to give your parting shot yeah. as you wind up. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I think for me to to have a lot of devotion to St. Joseph, mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, for me being a young professional and many people being in the situation of just being um, working, working people, that we can we can ask St. Joseph to help us to do our work well, to offer it up, and just to be good Christians. Okay. Yeah. Well, that is powerful. And today is your last show with us, Lou. Yes, it's wow. my last show. Wow. <laughs> Anyway, let me not go into details, yes. but um, I wish you all the best. Asante. And may St. Joseph be your guide. Asante sana. May he help you to do that which you're going to do, right? Thank you. Very happy and excited, yeah. but you have delivered quite Thank well. You. I really appreciate so much. And thanks to uh, Akina Patrick for helping yes. me meet this lovely girl, Lucy. Hi. A job. Thank you so much, Lou. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. And thank you for the show as well. All right. Talk to me. 0712 is the SMS line. Or on Facebook page, Radio Mini 88.3 FM.